Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us for this eighth annual Gravely Celebration at the National Museum of the Surface Navy aboard the battleship Iowa. My name is Mike Shatinsky. I'm a retired Rear Admiral and I'm the chairman of the board of the National Museum of the Surface Navy at the battleship Iowa. Uh, one of the things that I have the greatest pride about of, of serving over my uh, 37 years in uniform is that when I retired uh, a number of years ago, um, I looked at the faces of our sailors on board our ships and I saw the face of our nation. I think our Navy, our surface Navy is a, a diverse force and is inclusive, but I can say that knowing that, I say that knowing that there's still a journey ahead, there's still a long, a, a long way to go. So much progress has been made uh, and Admiral Gravely who we're celebrating today has been uh, a role model for all of us as, as we've been on this journey. Uh, we have a great group of panelists here today to spend some time with you, a uh, very diverse group. Uh, I'm going, uh, and I'd like to introduce first uh, retired Navy Rear Admiral Sinclair Harris. He's an African American Naval, American Naval officer who has his own journey following in the footsteps of Vice Admiral Gravely uh, through the ranks to make Admiral. Um, also with us is author Paul Stillwell, uh, a man who knows Admiral Gravely as well as anybody alive. He's the author of a book, Trailblazer, which is in essence an autobiography co-written with uh, Paul by Admiral Gravely himself. And uh, based on long hours, many hours, wonderful hours, uh, Paul got to spend with Admiral Gravely and his wife. Also, we have with us uh, retired Navy Captain Elisa Ambrose. Uh, she has commanded the USS Gravely, one of the Navy's most powerful warships, a destroyer. And she is a group of a generation of naval officers, female naval officers that had their own journey uh, in, in, in their own right, in the footsteps of Admiral Gravely. Um, it's it's um, um, eye-opening to me to know that our female naval officers weren't able to command warships until 30 years after Admiral Gravely commanded his own warship in the 1950s. And, um, Elisa is one of the peers that led our Navy in, uh, in, into that uh, integration. And uh, finally, uh, we're also joined by Midshipman Cam Davis, a midshipman at the U.S. Naval Academy, and he's about to start his own journey um, in the U.S. Navy as a, an African-American Naval officer. And our host with us today is Tanya Acker. You all know her best as a celebrity judge, but she's also an attorney, commentator, and many other things. But most important to us, we're blessed to have her as one of our members of our board of directors for the National Museum of the Surface Navy aboard the battleship Iowa. Uh, with that introduction, um, again, welcome aboard to everybody. Tanya, to you, please, to uh, lead our celebration. Tanya, I believe you're mute still. You would think with all of these months on Zoom, I would have remembered that. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you for your leadership on the ship. Thank you to all of you uh, for joining us for this, our eighth annual Gravely celebration uh, at the, aboard the National Museum of the Surface Navy at the Battleship Iowa. Uh, we are here to honor and celebrate the life and legacy of Vice Admiral Gravely. Uh, some of you who've joined us before may know this, but for those of you who are new, uh, we hope we'll see you again. Uh, and here's a little bit about Vice Admiral Gravely, the man uh, who's brought us all here today. He was the first African-American to command a Navy warship. On top of that, he was the first African-American to command a Navy warship in combat. He became the first African-American to become an admiral in the Navy, and then the first African-American to be a vice admiral in the Navy. After that, the first African-American to be a US fleet commander. He was commander of the, of the third fleet. Now I should modify what I said. Uh, I described uh, Vice Admiral Gravely as the first African-American commander of a warship, but that's not quite true. He's the first in the 20th century because the very first was a man called Robert Smalls. His picture is right behind me. He was born an enslaved South Carolinian. 
he commandeered a Confederate ship, sailed that ship past Confederate battle uh, checkpoints, delivered that ship to the Union Army. He became a legislator in his state of South Carolina, where he had been born enslaved. And then he went on uh, and served in the United States Congress. And then he bought the house where his former master lived, who had enslaved him. Robert Smalls then uh, bore, uh, uh, Robert Smalls bears the name. He lent his name to Camp Robert Smalls, which served as a training camp uh, for African Americans when the Navy was still segregated. And that's where his picture's right behind me. And that's where Vice Admiral Gravely trained. Uh, just for the record, to my left is Madam C.J. Walker, the first self-made millionaire in the United States, also a first self-made woman millionaire in the United States, also African-American. So I tell you all of these stories because it's important to remember that Robert Smalls, Madam C.J. Walker, and Vice Admiral Gravely, who we're here today to honor and celebrate, they did what they did. They accomplished their feats when racism wasn't just more overt than it was today. In some places, racism was the law of the land. It was illegal not to discriminate against African-Americans uh, during the time when Vice Admiral Gravely accomplished some of what he did, yet he did it. And his story is the inspiration for so many of us, and it's been a particular inspiration for our incredible panel. So with that, I wanna to turn to our panel. Thank you again, all of you for joining us. And let me start with you, Rear Admiral Harris. Can you tell us just a little bit about how Vice Admiral Gravely's story inspired you? Well, thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Mike, for allowing me to be part of this uh, great panel. You know, um, quite simply, Admiral, and please stay with this picture right here. Admiral Gravely was our star. And you see uh, some of the some of his uh, descendants, some of the uh, men that followed him as African American admirals uh, in his wake. He had the professionalism uh, down. He was always competent in his jobs. He had the perseverance to fight through the discrimination, through the racism, through those who would think less of him simply because of his skin color. And he had the grace long before we heard um, uh, President Ob Mrs. Obama talk about uh, when they go low, we go high. Admiral Gravely and his wife Alma had the humility and grace uh, to step above uh, the fray and handle themselves with dignity and courage and strength through all that they went through. Um, I, I get, go ahead and take the picture down. I keep this portrait uh, with me. I've had it ever since I made uh, one star. Uh, Captain Mark Rios, a Hispanic officer, actually gave it to me, and I've kept it with me in my office or on my ships ever since there as a reminder. He's our North Star. Thank you, Rear, Al uh, Rear Admiral Harris. Captain Ambrose, what about you? Uh, you commandeered the ship, or you led the ship, excuse me, uh, the USS Gravy, uh, Gravely. Uh, named for Vice Admiral Gravely. So certainly he was an inspiration and is an inspiration to you. Tell us a little bit about what Vice Admiral Gravely's story means to you personally. Thanks for having me uh, on the panel today. And um, yes, Tanya, uh, Admiral Gravely definitely served as an inspiration to me um, once I got to know the story um, of his Navy experience, Navy career. And it's definitely a story that um, pervaded the attitudes of the crew on Gravely. Everyone knew um, we teach his story at indoctrination classes to new sailors that report aboard, um, even if they hadn't already known it. And certainly at the time that I had command of the ship, there was still a handful of crew members that had commissioned the ship a few years earlier and had the opportunity to hear Mrs. Gravely speak and were inspired by the stories that she told. And I um, continued that as well, like I said, at the indoctrination classes. And we spoke of Admiral Gravely's legacy often on board the ship. 
everyone knew and took a real sense of um, pride and responsibility in, in doing the best. The motto of the ship is first to conquer. And we talk about um, upholding ourselves personally with dignity and respect and pride. And professionally, we certainly carried that same theme through with um, our performance during training and inspections and on deployments and the ship won battle efficiency awards for, for that, um, for those accomplishments. And it's something that every sailor on board gravely feels a personal responsibility to make sure that they are doing their best to live up to the legacy of Admiral Gravely. Paul, you I literally wrote the book on Vice Admiral Gravely. Can you tell us a little bit about how it was he was able to summon uh, the wherewithal, the strength and the courage to accomplish the things that he did at a time when the world was frankly so unfriendly and hostile even to African-Americans? Well, thank you, Tanya. Before I answer that specific question, I want to follow up on both Admiral Harris and Captain Ambrose in saluting Mrs. Gravely. Uh, she is 99 years old. I talked to her earlier this week, and she was the wind beneath his wings. There's a lot of separation in a naval career, family separation, and not all of them make it. He loved the Navy, and she said perhaps she loved it even more than he did. So she enabled him to be successful. The world in which he grew up fit those situations that you've described about segregation and Jim Crow and illegal situations. He suffered because of that. He told me a time traveling across the country when they had to stay in a motel in Memphis across the tracks. There was no heat, so the Gravelys and their two sons huddled together. When he was in the Navy, there was limited opportunity for black officers. The idea was that they would be capped off at the rank of Lieutenant Commander and not given opportunities for broad career enhancement. He made his own opportunity. He volunteered for a do-it-yourself executive officer course that led to him becoming executive officer of the destroyer Theodore E. Chandler. Then he became acting commanding officer then he became the first, as you said, commanding officer of a U.S. Navy warship in the 20th century, USS Falgut. So he had to make his own luck in a way. He was a man of grace, dignity, and I found him to be a man of great humility, which is rare in someone who has accomplished as much as he has. Thank you. Thank you for that, Paul, and thank you uh, for these wonderful images uh, that we're now seeing of Vice Admiral Gravely and his wife, Alma. Cam, uh, you are newer in your naval career, uh, a midshipman. Uh, tell us what his story, what Vice Admiral Gravely's story means to you, especially now at a time when, you know, you look at the work that people like him uh, like, like Vice Admiral Gravely and others did to make the world more comfortable and better for us. You in the Navy, what does his story mean to you? The one thing that Vice Admiral Gravely's story means to me um, is it's just his leadership uh, and the way he was able to lead through, through serious adversity, um, adversity that I will probably never experience in my life. However, um, him being a pioneer is just so inspiring to me because it shows me the standard that I had to live up to now. My story is now gonna be integrated with his story by being an African-American officer in the United States Navy. And by integrating our stories together, I need to live up to everything that he stood for, humility, grace, care, um, professionalism, competence, all of those things that he embodied, I need to be able to go into the fleet and know that I'm living up to the standards that he set before me. Thank you for that. And really, it's all about living up to that standard uh, and really do, uh, doing honor to the legacy that he left. 
part of that legacy was turning uh, a challenge, turning dark moments into great opportunities. Rear Admiral Harris, can you give us an example of how you've done that in your exceptional life and career? Well, I can tell you, Tanya, uh, that's happened a number of times. In fact, uh, uh, Captain Ambrose was part of one of those challenges that was turned around uh, because she was an angel sent from heaven, quite frankly, to my group. Um, but I'm gonna speak to the one uh, that began my career. So I applied when I was in high school, I applied for the Naval Academy. I didn't get in, uh, didn't have a very good jump shot. I wasn't as handsome or tall or, or smart as Cam is. Um, I think I got a maximum of, of two bars, you know, during my time in officer candidate school. Uh, but uh, I, I didn't get in, I went to James Madison, finished there, found a job, didn't like the job, um, and decided I was going to join the Navy um, uh, at that point in time. And coming out of officer candy school where the uh, presiding speaker called us the blue light special of officers, which just made us so proud. Um, you know, I, I knew for sure coming at my commissioning that I was the lowest rung of officer possible because the top one were the academy, obviously. The next rung were those going to ROTC. And then there was the rest of us that came out of officer camp. So I had a chip on my shoulder for the 34 years that I was in the Navy. And, and so I think that because I didn't get in the way that I had wanted to go in, um, it, 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 it strengthened me, it gave me a resolve, it, it gave me something to, to work harder for because I, I knew that I wasn't as good as the rest. There's something about uh, knowing that you've got to push yourself and overcome something uh, that can really inspire you to greater things. Uh, Captain Ambrose, a former commander of the USS Gravely, tell us about a time in your life where you had the experience of approaching something difficult and turning it into a positive moment. Thanks, Tanya. Um, I would say that in one of my very first moments in command was one of the largest challenges I had to face. I took command right before Christmas and the crew went on the holiday break and got underway the first week of January, uh, was scheduled to get underway in freezing cold conditions. And literally two days before we were getting underway, two of my absolute top watchstanders asked me, if they could miss the underway because their wives were due to have babies and hadn't had them yet <laughs> and wanted to be there for it. Uh, one of those was the navigator and you can't get underway without a navigator. So, you know, uh, I kind of took an assessment of the situation and decided we, we needed to figure out how to make it work because I wanted um, well, first of all, I believe that people should be there for the birth of their children, but I also wanted my crew to understand that I valued each person and their individual needs. And clearly this was an important need for these two men to be there um, for that event. And so I uh, had to get a lot of special permissions and find a new temporary navigator. But it was a great opportunity to um, promote from within, have other people rise to those watch standing positions and have the crew come together as a team. And I think it was a great opportunity for the crew to understand my personality and what I valued and, and to show them that I do value each individual person and, and certainly their contribute. Uh, their contributions to the mission, but also to understand that I respect everyone's individuality and their individual needs and, and what they could contribute. Um, so getting underway, it turned out a very successful opportunity. We got those guys back 10 days later, um, forever happy that they had not missed their babies being born. And and I think um, it really set the stage for my tour that the crew knew that I would have their backs. And, and, and several times throughout my experiences over the next year and a half, people made it clear to me that, that they would have my back because they knew that I would have theirs. And so that turned out to be a really positive first impression.
I think it's important that uh, we emphasize that the story you just told is a story that's told by the woman who commanded the USS Gravely, the ship named after the man who once upon a time wasn't allowed to sleep with his family uh, in a room in a hotel that was open to everyone else. So everybody just remember, things may sometimes seem dark, the world can change, the world gets better when we all make it so. Paul, uh, Captain Ambrose just told a story about leadership and it's about the type of leadership where you look after those who are res uh, responsible for reporting to you. How did uh, Vice Admiral Gravely also exemplify that type of leadership? I salute you, Captain Ambrose, because loyalty down produces loyalty up. I just want to throw in a side story. I was commissioned in 1966 as a blue light special and uh, went to Coronado, California for some amphibious training before reporting to my first ship. And while I was in the barber shop one day, I had to wait for the next open chair and I picked up an ebony magazine and there was a story about Commander Gravely as CO of the destroyer Tossig. And this was a huge revelation to me that there was a black commanding officer and I was very impressed. He was also someone who took care of his men. They were all men in that time and made opportunities for himself as his rep reputation spread. The thing is in the Navy, you seize the opportunities and then performance is what makes the difference on what happens after that. He succeeded as the commanding officer of the Falgut, of the Tossig in combat in, in Vietnam, of the Jewett also in combat in Vietnam. He came ashore and again, timing worked out for him. Admiral Elmo Zumwalt became the CNO, Chief of Naval Operations in 1970 and proactively worked to promote opportunities for African-Americans in the Navy. The timing was great. Admiral Gravely was the first to be selected as a flag officer in the US Navy, black flag officer, and went on, as you said, to three stars. So it's a combination of hard work and looking out for your people. You know, Cam, speaking of hard work, looking out for your people, uh, inheriting a legacy, as you mentioned, you know, you talked about some of the current obstacles, uh, current challenges that still exist. What's your advice for getting through those with the grace and dignity that Vice Admiral Gravely did? What's your advice to young people today who are trying to navigate uh, those kinds of situations? I think in order to navigate situations is some of the things that we're dealing with now, racial injustice, um, you know, economic craziness in the market, anything that you're gonna like encounter. Uh, I, I think it's, really key to look into yourself first. So self-reflection is the one thing that I would recommend to you first is you've got to understand who you are. You got to know your strengths. You got to know your weaknesses. And then you also have to radiate um, who you are to other people as well. You can't deviate from who you are. You got to be true to yourself. You have to um, understand when you're getting off track and have somebody, have an accountability partner that's going to uh, kind of pull the reins on you and rein you back into who you actually are. And then secondly, I think the biggest thing is communication. Um, if we're not voicing these things, if we're not voicing our opinions on the matters, if we see something and we don't speak up, we're just as bad as the people that are committing the injustice that we see. Um, so we need to be you know, actively communicating, actively participating in um, discussions to um, not only shine light on the issues that are at hand, but also to uh, fix them as well. You know, uh, Rear Admiral Harris, so much of what young people have to grapple with now is how to figure out the way to address or combat situations that they feel to be unfair, 
uh, and the way to do that when maybe the person or the uh, persons who, uh, who they think are subjecting them to the unfairness, maybe they're in a position of power, maybe they're in a position of, thor uh, of authority. What's your advice to people, uh, to young people about how you navigate a situation when you think that uh, you're not getting fair or just treatment. And maybe the person who uh, is on the other side of that is an authority. Maybe it's somebody who you can't just ignore. What do you say to young people who find themselves in that situation? So let's first talk about the word fair and unpack that. And I'll never forget uh, Lieutenant General, uh, President of the National Defense University at the time, uh, Fran Wilson. When I came into her office, I was a lieutenant commander and I was hot about something. And, and I kept saying, this is not fair. This is not fair. And she looked at me and she smiled and said, Sinclair, fair has nothing to do with life. It's just a condition of the weather. Uh, and then later on talking to uh, ju an officer junior to me, another woman, Susan Fortney, uh, we we're talking about fairness. And she said, yes, sir. But you know, I've heard that fair is, all you, is what you pay to get on the bus. That's about it. So, so that's why I put the word fair, okay? But now what do you do? So now this gets back to my being a surface warfare officer. I know Alyssa and Paul and Mike will all understand this very, very well. When you're driving your ship, there are controllable factors and uncontrollable factors. Uncontrollable, the weather, the wind, the tide. You've got nothing to do with that except for to pray and hopefully they'll work out. What can you control? You can control how much rudder you use, how much speed you use, the time of day you do it, how prepared your team is. The same thing goes with life. There are uncontrollable things. You'll have bosses you got no real control over. You have situations that you'll come into that you can't do a doggone thing about. But what you can control is how you react to them, is how professional you are how you, back to Mrs. Obama, when they go low, you go high. So you can look yourself in the mirror, you can stare yourself in the face, you can look into your own running lights and you can say, this is how I'm going to be no matter what the world tries to do to me. And Paul, how do you think that Vice Admiral Gravely, you know, when in the, in the course of facing so much overt discrimination that he could not control, you know, Rear Admiral Harris just made a good point. There are some things that sometimes you just can't, you can't control. Uh, what was Vice Admiral Gravely's uh, way of managing those situations uh, with such grace and dignity and elegance and in a way where he didn't let that opposition stop him? Uh, was there some sort of general mantra or advice by which he, or, or theory of life by which he lived? Well, my interpretation from getting to know him was that he believed that that was background noise and you have to compartmentalize and focus on the job itself. You realize that there are things that you can't do anything about. You roll with the punches. You make opportunities to do the things that you like to do and that you do well. He truly enjoyed being on the bridges of ships. And as he got higher in rank, of course, he had more and more control. The captain of the ship is virtually supreme on board. And so that problem sort of went away as he got higher and higher in rank. And I just admire the way he stuck to his job and made sure he did it the best he could. Captain Ambrose, uh, you've already told one story about that type of leadership, uh, about really leading with grace. What's some advice that you would give to young people today who are trying to navigate situations that, you know, maybe they can't control them, maybe they are unfair, but in order to come out the other end of it, you gotta come out the other end of it. Uh, how do you tell, what would be your advice to people, to young people as to how you do that? Well, I would say don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> Take it one bite at a time as we've always heard and break it, the situation apart into manageable pieces. Um, 
probably not all of it is uncontrollable. Um, respond to the pieces of it that that you can take control over and and the pieces of it that aren't in your control you need to make a decision of uh like in totality the situation may feel terrible but the pieces of it that you can handle you kind of discount and then you decide the pieces that are left are they something you need to take immediate action on or can, as my mother always says, when you don't know what to do, sometimes it's okay to do nothing and just wait and see. Um, I feel like there's been various circumstances in my life where something rubbed me the wrong way and you have to wait and see, is this a pattern of something that's going in a very bad direction or is this an isolated incident that you can talk about after and say, I didn't appreciate this, but let's move on from there. And, and each circumstance is different, I suppose, is how I view that. Cam, what's advice that you would give now to your high school self? I got a lot of things I would say to my my high school self because I was very uneducated coming to the United States Naval Academy. Uh, however, I think the one thing that I would tell myself, and I've heard it many a times, I think the one thing I would tell myself was, uh, don't forget to enjoy the moment because we get so caught up in what we have to do next, especially here, we have military obligations, rigorous academics, and the fact that I'm a division one athlete just kind of is the icing on the cake. Uh, with practice and everything else that we have to do with that. Um, not to mention that I've been in and out of quarantine for at least 35 days throughout the um, academic year. So it's been difficult. It's been hard. But however, I, I just need to tell myself over and over again, I would tell this to anybody, um, enjoy the moment. Uh, it's, it's one thing that's so easy to slip away, but it's one thing that you also remember forever. So if you let it pass you by, um, you're not going to have anything to look back on. You're not going to have anything to cherish. Like what are the stories um, that you're going to be able to tell your kids. And we talk about it a lot here um, about what kind of legacy do you want to leave? And when you enjoy those moments and you continually take those moments for what they are, then you start to have a story and then you start to have a legacy that you can leave behind for people to come through here and then also your kids as well. Well said. I, you know, we are living in a moment and Cam, you touched upon this pandemic and so many of our uh, guests today are being schooled at home, educated at home. Uh, we've had this event for eight years. This is our eighth annual Gravely Celebration. It's the first one we've ever had to do uh, sitting at home in our computers. We are normally at the ship uh, in fellowship with one another. And so it, it's an easy moment. And it's easy, I think, to become disheartened and overwhelmed with uh, so much of what we're dealing with. And I think it's an easy moment to lose sight of uh, optimism and of why we can or should be optimistic. Uh, I, I refer to the fact that I sit here as the uh, spiritual descendant of people like Robert Smalls and Madam C.J. Walker and Vice Admiral Gravely, uh, but for the sacrifices that they made, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't enjoy the life or the privileges that I do. Uh, so it reminds me that even when things seem dark, it's important to look for positive opportunity. Uh, Rear Admiral Harris, what makes you optimistic today, uh, especially when we're constantly being, bar uh, constantly being bombarded with so many images of negativity? What makes you optimistic? Well, I'll tell you, there are a lot of things that make me optimistic, but the thing that resonates in my mind constantly, constantly, is America's motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. And while we've got folks that uh, disagree on everything from you know, when you say good morning to what's good about it, to uh, you know, everything else, uh, and there are people on the far right or the far left or this or that, nothing. When I talk to Americans across this country, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, old, young, female, male, I find much more in common 
much more alignment, uh, much more we are going to make things better and far fewer we're going to make things worse. So that gives me great hope. I see young men like Cam Davis here coming into the United States Navy that I love. And if I had younger knees and, and a little more hair, I would go do it all again because it's going to be leaders like him. It'll be leaders like uh, Captain Ambrose and the women that have fall, uh, have come behind her that are leading our great Navy and our nation forward. So remember the motto, E Pluribus Unum. There are people that are not going to agree, but the majority have I've run into are right-minded and positive for our great country. Amen to that. Uh, Captain Ambrose, you are a leader, you're a role model. Uh, you have been your own groundbreaking, barrier blasting uh, role model for so many. What makes you optimistic? Well, <laughs> I, I think that Sink said it so well. I agree. I think there is way more that unites us than divides us on average. Um, I've mentioned to some people that um, I felt like in, in my viewpoint, we should treat everyone with dignity and respect and the Navy has made a policy of that and I'm so glad. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to see uh, the policy changing um, to include transgender members. Uh, I think allowing everybody to serve honorably is the only way to say that we are absolutely going to treat everyone with dignity and respect. If you allow one group to be discriminated against, it gives tacit underlying uh, approval for anyone to be discriminated against. I had, um, I, I call it the privilege that one of my officers came to me and declared themselves as transgender minutes before we were ready to deploy. And it was the first transgender officer in the service fleet. And we watched that transition happen over the course of our deployment. And I'm so proud of how my crew didn't respond to it. And at the very end of our deployment at our Pride Month celebration, we celebrated the fact that we were truly diverse and how all that matters is doing the job effectively and how when you come together in the Navy, it's all about being a good sailor and, you know, performing the mission. And I'm very proud to be a part of that and, and to see that continuing now in the future of the Navy. Uh, and thank you again. I think so many people would thank you for your leadership on that. Uh, you know, Paul, what is something that you think more people need to know about Vice Admiral Gravely, especially in these moments uh, moments today, whereas, you know, Rear Admiral uh, Harris said, we can disagree about the time of day, uh, the color of the sky. I mean, there's no place where we can't find an opportunity to find, uh, to fight with one another. What is something, or, or what is a message from Vice Admiral Gravely's life that you think is particularly important for people to hear or know about today? Tanya, I think the, the lesson he imparted, and, and he was such a down to earth individual, is that you make the opportunities and then do the best you can with those opportunities. On the subject of optimism, I have to go to my dad. Uh, he was by nature an optimist and, and I follow in that. When he was a pastor of a church in World War II, he preached sermons about racial tolerance and understanding. And after a while, a member of the congregation came to him and said, we're tired of that. Let's get back to the regular things. So as an object lesson to his congregation, he brought in a black minister to baptize me on my first birthday. 
we moved to Springfield, Missouri, and he would go out and give talks to civic groups about George Washington Carver, the great African-American scientist. That has got to rub off of you. And the attitudes we take as people watch what we do will rub off on them. So project positivity, project tolerance, project understanding and caring for our fellow human beings. Project positivity, project tolerance, and project understanding. You know, Cam, uh, a lot of our guests today are a part of the social media generation and the social media world where projecting those things is sometimes a rarity. How do you tell, how can young people sort of embrace positivity and understanding and awareness uh, and the type of gracious leadership that uh, Vice Admiral Gravely embodied, that Captain Ambrose talked about, that Rear Admiral Harris talked about. How can young people embrace those values and demonstrate them in a world where we're constantly bombarded by so much negativity? I think the first thing that they can do, you know, to in the process, because it is a process to embody something like that because, you know, Captain Ambrose, Vice Admiral Gravely, um, Rear Admiral Harris, they didn't get to this position um, instantly. They didn't just display grace instantly. And we have to understand first that it's a process and we have to understand, you know, even myself as a young person, uh, we have to understand that um, nothing's going to be perfect. We have to understand that we're uh, consistently trying to work through the issues that we're dealt with, like the circumstances that we're dealt. Um, so I think the biggest thing in projecting that is, um, you know, learning what the negativities are. What are the stereotypes that are out there? Uh, what are the microaggressions that are occurring? And once you learn about the negatives and you learn that what you don't want to happen whenever you come into a position of leadership, whenever you're the captain of your basketball team, or whenever you uh, graduate from the United States Naval Academy, you're uh, a division officer on a ship, uh, you understand what neg the negativities are and you try and uh, gear your leadership style. You try and gear everything that you're doing away from all those things. So I think education is the biggest thing. And I think people really need to start executing on that. That's the one thing I would tell young people, including myself, continually over and over. Um, when you see something and you understand it and you understand what's going on, you understand what's wrong, you understand what's right, execute what's right consistently over and over. There's never a wrong time um, or there's always a right time to do what's right. And that right time to do what's right is now. Um, and it's super important for our young people to understand. Oh, that is so wonderfully said. Execute on what is right and educate yourself. And before we go uh, to our q and I'm going to invite you all to participate. And when I say you all, you out there, our viewers, uh, to participate in an opportunity to execute on what's right and to educate yourselves uh, by participating in our essay contest the essay is sponsored by Collier Wash Nakazawa LLP. We have prizes. Uh, you will be honored at our uh, gala for the National Museum of the Surface Navy. The deadline is April 16th, 2021. Go to the website. You can see the slide right up there on the screen, www.gravelyexperience.org for more information about the essay contest. Uh, please join us. Join, get your essay in, tell your friends. Uh, it's an opportunity to write about, learn about Vice Admiral Gravely. And also, you know, uh, you've heard each of our panelists tonight talk about living up to the legacy and placing themselves in history. All of you out there, every single one of you, you are a part of that legacy. You are a part of that history. And this essay contest is an opportunity for you to tell us about it. So please uh, go to the website and we hope that you will uh, join, uh, participate in the essay contest. Money, we've got prizes uh, and it's also a wonderful opportunity uh, to participate uh, in, in this incredible opportunity with the ship and the honor of the Vice Admiral. Uh, we have some questions. And I've got a question here from uh, Pete Castiglione. Thank you for such an inspirational program. Are there plans to promote and educate youth, especially high schoolers on this topic? I believe it is something very much needed for our youth in our schools, especially during our challenging and divisive times to help inspire and plant a seed 
for future leadership development. I think we've got someone uh, from the ship who's going to speak to uh, our educational plans uh, for to kind of continue this going. We do this every year, every year for Black History Month, we will be honoring Vice Admiral Gravely, but the opportunities to educate are certainly not simply limited to that month, uh, not simply limited to February. Uh, did uh, do we have a comment from Jolene from the Battleship Iowa on our educational efforts? Um, I'd be glad to step up and, and answer that, um, Tanya. Please, uh, please do. Great. So um, this is our eighth annual Gravely celebration. Um, people don't probably know that Admiral Gravely actually served on the battleship Iowa as a communications officer during the Korean War. Um, it was uh, one of his early first jobs in, uh, in the Navy um, after World War II. Um, as Tanya said, we're taking this to the national level. Uh, in October, we're gonna ha have our first annual Freedom of the Seas Awards dinner. And one of the four key awards is going to be a Vice Admiral Gravely Award, recognizing um, someone uh, at a national level for what they've done. And, and we've been awarding uh, uh, um, um, Americans um, with an award like that, but not quite at the national level in the past eight years. So this, that will be an exciting step. Now, now to educating children, um, I think uh, aboard the Iowa, uh, we've had an incredible uh, program to educate children uh, underserved children from schools at LAUSD um, in STEM topics. And we brought them on board and given them a chance to see uh, the Navy, see a Navy ship um, and learn in that in-situ environment um, and give them a chance to see uh, what it is like to serve in the Navy. Um, it's not a program specifically like this, but I think ultimately for me as chairman of the board, there's something called leadership by example, which is important in everything that we do. And as we as an organization, we're a museum, not a warship anymore. It's important for us to be inclusive and diverse in everything that we do. Tanya is on our board of directors. Our board is becoming more and more diverse every day. Uh, we're not exactly like our nation and our demographics right now, but we're approaching 50%, if not more, female in our leadership positions and our hired crew on board. And as, as we live diversity on board the ship and do that by example, I think that's gonna make a difference. As to formal programs like this, um, this is really our first um, program that's broadcast to schools like this. Uh, and it's been driven by um, this COVID crisis that we're in the midst of. We're going to keep doing this. We're changing our business model. We're going to be trying to reach more and more. Yes, it's great that we can get 35,000 underserved students aboard the ship um, every year in a STEM environment. We haven't been able to do that, but now we're reaching out in this way. Um, we, we will do more programming like this. Uh, we'll do what we do on board and whether it's a sleepover or a STEM education program, uh, young people will be able to see what uh, a life of service is about, particularly on, uh, with the US Navy. And um, this is just a start. Uh, it's, this has been a journey, uh, just like with Admiral Gravely and the women in our Navy, Elisa, and what you've lived, uh, this is a journey, and this is a, this this broadcast is a start as to what we're going to be doing in the future with this new model. Um, hopefully, that answers the question. Thank you for that, Mike. And I'm also going to ask uh, Rear Admiral Harris. He has some information about an award given by the National Naval Officers Association in honor of Vice Admiral Gravely. Uh, Rear Admiral Harris, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, and it's as easy as this. Go to nnoa.org. Once you get to our website, go to the little uh, our the magnifying glass and type in gravely. The third article there you'll see is the NNOA Admiral Gravely uh, Leadership Award that is going to uh, students at uh, Naval Junior ROTC schools across the country to uh, uh, honor uh, his legacy through uh, to their leadership by their leadership and honor his legacy. 
Thank you, Rear Admiral Harris. And Leonard Jablon also uh, in the chat, everybody, you'll see that aboard the Iowa, we provide a number of STEM opportunities as soon as uh, the world gets a little more back to normal and we can open up the ship again to those types of opportunities, we will do so. Uh, I have a question for Paul. Uh, the question is, are Admiral Grave is Admiral Gravely's oral history accessible uh, from the USNI. Is it accessible? Well, the answer is very much yes, although it's a kind of difficult during the COVID era. The book is called Trailblazer, which is essentially his life story, and that would be available on Amazon or other book outlets. I just would like to add that I served on, in the crew of the USS New Jersey, which is a sister battleship to the Iowa, and also mentioned that some of the oral history work involved the Golden 13, who were the first black naval officers commissioned several months before Admiral Gravely was. And I got particularly close to George Cooper and his wife, Peg. They were almost like a second set of parents. And he had a piece of advice that is remarkable. He said, whatever you have achieved in life, you got there because a lot of other people helped you. You therefore have an obligation to help those who come along after you. Well said, and it's something that um, I certainly try to remember. I think that all of us do. Uh, before we go, we have a few minutes left. I, maybe we could just do a quick rapid fire. Uh, something that we wanna leave our, our attendees with. Um, you all, thank you for joining us uh, to this incredible panel. And thank you to all of you out there who've taken time out of your day to sit and, and join us for this program. Uh, one thing, let's just quickly give uh, our attendees one piece of advice, uh, one nugget that we would like to share with them uh, as a gift before they go. Rear Admiral Harris, I'll start with you. Service counts. Serve your country, whether you do it in uniform um, or you go into some other service uh, organization, service counts, serve your country. America is worth it. Amen. Captain Ambrose? You're stronger than you think you are. Mm. You're going to face adversities in your life. No one can avoid it. You'll, you'll get through it. Some of it will be really hard, but you'll look back on it and be incredibly proud of yourself for what you've accomplished. And there, there will be moments where you think, oh, I can't get through this and, and just keep pushing yourself because you're stronger than you think you are. Wonderfully said, Captain Ambrose. Uh, what about you, Paul Stilwell, author of Trail, uh, Trailblazer? Uh, you saw Mike Shatensky put up a copy of the book. It's available on Amazon, uh, Trailblazer. You must read it. Uh, Paul, what's your advice? Well, obviously, be yourself, but realize that whatever you do, people are watching you. They will see the example you set. So set an example that is worthy of you and them. Wonderfully, wonderfully said Paul Stilwell. And Cam, what about you? What's the nugget that you'd like to give as a gift to our attendees? One thing I would have to say is dare to be different. Mm -hmm. There is nothing um, more sincere. There is nothing more authentic about a person um, who does something that is outside of the norm, uh, whether it's picking up a piece of trash, whether it's staying late to, to study or to, you know, stay in the gym and work extra on your game, whatever, whatever your ambition is, dare to be different, set yourself apart, um, and the results will come. Thank you for that. And, uh, for my part, uh, mine is remember, this is your country, know your history, own it, I uh, do better, move the ball forward and enter into the legacy that is certainly yours and your, uh, your, your just desserts. Take your place at the table, people, and make your voices heard. Uh, everything gets better. We don't end up in a place where uh, we're all able to sit here freely 
uh, in an open conversation with an, uh, one another without having realized that a bunch of people who came before us fought and struggled to make it so. So now it's our job to make it better for the people who are coming after us next. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, this opportunity. Thank you to this incredible, incredible panel. Uh, thank you to the chair of our board, Rear Admiral Shatensky. Uh, and thank you to the wonderful staff of the Iowa, uh, Jolene Dutheridge, Moran, Moran Fangler. Uh, and thank you also to our essay contest sponsor, Collier Wash, uh, Collier Wash Nakazawa LLP. Don't forget to participate in the essay contest, everybody. Uh, enjoy, take care, stay safe and be well. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you at the Iowa really soon.